and Penny, who are just one person. And I will say that uh, that's just come through. We are recording this, um, so um, please be aware of that. Um, so we have Nigel and Penny, um, we have uh, Sam Parsons, and we have Nick Green. Um, the way I'd like to run this is that they're going to do a short introduction and um, talk about uh, a little bit about themselves and about their what their views on grass finishing are. And then I would like uh, lots of questions. Uh, I'd like to have this much more of a discussion. Uh, so please put your questions into the uh, chat box um, and we will be uh, looking at those and uh, I'll call on you to ask when uh, it's, uh, it's your go. So uh, first of all, we have uh, Nigel and Penny at uh, Brightly Farm in Surrey. Uh, they sell their mob grazed cattle um, through their, their own farm shop. And uh, in addition, uh, Nigel works with Pasture for Life, um, uh, helping certified farmers um, with their Pasture for Life supply chain in the south of England. Uh, secondly, we have Sam Parsons, um, who is uh, who has kindly stepped in at the last minute due to COVID. Um, we had somebody else lined up. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. Sam is the estate manager at Balkaski Estate in Fife. Uh, they have a herd of uh, pedigree Lincoln Red cattle uh, that are mob grazed and uh, pasture for life certified. He also has a, a flock of pasture for life certified sheep too, uh, which is quite rare in um, pasture for life farmers currently. Um, and finally, we have Nick Green, uh, who is uh, the Green Butcher in Twickenham. Um, and uh, people who were at our AGM will recognize him as the proud recipient of the Russ Carrant Award for his work promoting pasture for life produce. Um, he works very closely with Horton House Farm in Wiltshire, uh, and the ethical dairy in uh, Dumfries. Uh, so, uh, Nigel, can I get you to start and give us a quick intro, please? You're on mute still. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, yeah, as Johnny has mentioned, uh, my wife and I, Penny, we run a small farm uh, in Outwood in Surrey. Um, in uh, 2014, um, Penny became a member of Pasture for Life, um, which has started started the uh, the, the journey. Um, 2015, we started we changed from a set stocking practice to a early stage mob grazing practice. Um, at that point in time, we were only producing stores, uh, selling at market. Um, then uh, 2018, we had a horrendous sale, so uh, decided that at that point in time we would we would swap our system to to finishing the cattle and try and find a market for them um, initially to finish and sell on to to local butchers. Um, very steep learning curve in that. Um, there's a lot of perception by butchers out there that you can't finish that well 100% on pasture. Um, However, I think the journey, you know, we've changed a lot of things. The first learning curve for us was genetics um, because uh, we, we, we focus a, a lot on, on, on the breed of our cattle and most importantly, the breed of our, of our bulls. Um, so what we, what, what we focus on now is a herd of what we call black baldies. So the Angus Hereford crosses. Uh, which we do, we do cross the breeds uh, fairly, re or change the breeds fairly regularly. Um, <clears throat> so we had a couple of disastrous bulls and decided to to, to focus on some pasture for life um, bull producers. One Angus that we then took from Rycote Park was extremely successful for us. Um, we then went on from from that one to another one, which we got from Rob Havard which has been even more successful. Um, 
the grazing that we do here, we are on heavy clay. Uh, we have seen extreme improvements in our pasture through the mob grazing system that we operate. We do move twice a day. Uh, I know a lot of people think that might be an awful lot of work, but we've got a fantastic routine where we do more morning and evening moves. And we are currently on about a 60 day rotation. Um, but the way the pasture is performing, uh, I think we could quite easily extend that, hopefully, fingers crossed, if the weather's on our side next year. Um, with a year like this year, with the drought, um, I know it was tough on majority of the country. Uh, for us, it was extremely hot down here. Um, however, we, we did get through it reasonably well. Uh, the cows stayed out. Uh, the real sort of pinch point in that heat, we did supplement a little bit of hay out there but the, the, the pasture stood up pretty damn good. We didn't take it all and it's bounced back phenomenally. Uh, and the way we're going at the moment, we will keep them out on, as I say, on heavy clay, certainly past Christmas, the way, the way we're set at the moment. For the first year this year, what we did do though, after the drought was break out that core finishing group uh, and get them ahead of the main herd. Uh, our practice up until now has always been run as one mob and it has worked. However, following on from that drought, it was a little bit tough getting the fat cover on some of our animals. Uh, and so we took the decision to put this finishing group ahead. Uh, and that's been incredibly, incredibly successful. The weight gain has been phenomenal. I can't quote you figures, but by eye you can see, and also the animals that were slaughtered at the moment, their cover is, is, is absolutely superb. Um, so without me going on too long, what, what we have developed is, a, is, a, is a, a group of butchers that buy from us regularly, um, one of which is a guy called Simon Taylor. He's an exceptional butcher. He is captain of the Team G Butchery team, so you can expect him to be very critical of the produce that he gets. Um, one of the most pleasing points for me this year was, uh, was the first animal we finished at, at 24 months was the nice steer. Uh, bred from the Angus uh, PFL bull. Uh, and Simon rang me afterwards and he said, Nice, this is as good as it gets. Um, if you can continue supplying me animals like this, I'll be buying for, from you for you know for, for the long future. Um, and so far we're continuing down that vein. So our aim really is to produce top quality meat uh, and, and so far the feedback from our direct customers, uh, from the butchers and, and actually from myself is the quality of produce that we are, we are, we are delivering is absolutely exceptional. Um, and it just, it just proves you can, you can do it on pasture alone uh, and you get that flavor, you get that tenderness uh, and you can get enough fat cover. Um, so that's it for now. Brilliant. Thanks, Nigel. Um, so that leads quite nicely on to Nick. Let's get the, the, the butcher's view. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nick Green. I've set up the Green Butcher in uh, South West London a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, we're in a sort of close working relationship, partnership with um, Johnny and Rachel Ryder at Horton House and David and Wilma Finney up at the Ethical Dairy in Dumfries. Both of those are dairy farms. Um, you know, there's obviously there's, there's a big backstory to how that came about and why we ended up with um, we're working with, with dairy farms. But all of our beef comes from dairy, um, and we've set up our business in a way we are a whole. You know, we only take whole carcass. We only take the whole animals from these farms, um, and everything we do, the focus of us is is is, a, is on serving our customers, obviously, but also serving the farm and, and eating eating. The priority for us is. A, I'm not actually the butcher, you know, actually technically I'm, I sort of run every other aspect of it, but um, we don't take carcasses based on, you know, gradings or the visual. Um, of course, that does play an important role in terms of being able to hang the meat and the economics of the yield you get from each carcass, et cetera. But we, our customers, um, we don't sell to restaurants really, and we don't sell into people who would see the, you know, the steaks or the carcasses hanging. So the appearance and the fat cover is less important to us as long as we can hang the meat for long enough to you know for it to sort of tenderize which is sort of up to three weeks the marbling in the, in the steaks of course is important and there's been a lot on the pfl forum this week about that about genetics and feed and stuff but we um you know, our focus is the eating quality and if, if our customers 
we eat it a lot and the, the beef from dairy is just has a has a uniquely beautiful buttery creamy you know texture and flavor and it tends you know because it's 100 grass fed after two or three weeks of hanging it's ready to eat um but the farms both the farms you know are like us are on a, on a journey and it's sort of you know in a sort of supportive way in in terms of breeding more bringing more beef bulls into the into the equation um you know putting more beef bulls into into the dairy on, onto the dairy cows um Horton House is our main sort of farm and Johnny Ryder is, you know, is, is, a, is a maverick and a pioneer in every regard. It is the PFL sort of dairy farm. Um, and every season he's bringing in more red pole balls, more low line Angus. Um, the, the, the dairy herd there is predominantly his jersey, Mont, his jersey uh, red pole predominantly from Montbelliard as well. But David's uh, Montbelliard's on Ayrshire herd and he, he's, he, angles, you know, he angles balls, everything um, for beef up there, I know. So, um, but... I mean, I, I, know I know there's lots of questions to come and I can, I'm, I'm not going to try and speak for David or Johnny as the farmers because I, you know, they could be on this webinar and they, they'd give you some fascinating some insight. But I'm just talking as the business, as a, as a sort of commercial end of the business and the fact that, our, you know, as long as it eats beautifully, um, I mean, I, I, we can also touch on the lamb. I know it's a beef sort of conversation, but the lamb we find is, is almost more pronounced in terms of the difference between lamb from 100% grass and, and what, you know, and, and the more conventional stuff that, is a very different product to eat and it's it can really blow you it blows, you know, blows our customers minds when they first have it so that's my angle is that this, it's all about the eating quality and our the customer we eat it enough of it to know that it's, it's a beautiful quality and quite differentiated from from most other products out there and the you know the visuals of the carcass and the, and the steaks it's less about that and um we're not we're not judged on that we're judged on eating quality thank you nick i i think that's um a very good point that um, lots of times when we're talking in partial life, we do talk about cattle, um, but there are a select few people who are producing um, pasture for life sheep too. Um, and uh, one of those people is uh, Sam Parsons. So nicely moves on to you, Sam. Tell us about your sheep and cattle. Thank you, Johnny, and good evening to everybody. Um, a bit like this webinar, I think I was uh, invited very late and I'm very late to the whole PFLA thing as well. So we actually only started our PFLA journey in 2019. And at Valkowski, we uh, had already converted to organic farming and we ran suckler cows and uh, a ewe flock. And as we increased our organic farmed area, so too did we increase our grassland. And so the, the move towards PFLA was driven twofold. One... Uh, was driven by the fact we thought that the market was going to fragment into cheap beef versus valuable beef uh, or valued beef. And uh, secondly, it was about cost of production. So we run about, uh, currently this year, I think we're about 320 suckler cows. Over the next two years, that'll move to 450 uh, as we increase the area we graze. And we run about 1,500 ewes over the, over the area. Um, we've been mob grazing since 2017, but this is the first year that we will outwinter every animal, uh, calves. We've outwintered cows for four years, I think, um, but fat cattle, calves, everything is out this winter. We dipped a toe into finishing um, um, cattle using pasture only, um, or pasture fed only, which is really at the time was a bit of a cheat. It was just grass silage. But we split a shed of fattening cattle in half, fed half on just grass silage, the other half on barley and beans and silage. Uh, and the difference in finishing time and weight, the weight was the same, the time was an extra 60 days. Uh, a quick calculation, at barley at 300 pounds a tonne and beans at 450, led me to believe this was something we should do. So now we're learning how to finish outside on grass and how to store grass uh, for winter grazing, what the quality of that grass is, and how to supplement if need be outside with bale grazing or um, we're, we're really learning in this what the mixes of grass need to be and we're also bumping into things as we go along and finding um, that the age-old issues of minerals worms uh, as in parasitic worms in cattle are still there we still have to deal with them when do we deal with them how do we deal with them but Essentially, we are finishing our cattle at 60 days older than we were before. Um, arguably, we were heading towards 400 kilo carcasses at one point with our 
uh, initial system back in 2016, 17, and knowing that the market is looking for smaller carcasses, actually finishing at uh, 320 kilos, 340 kilos with native breeding suits us. Hence the switch to Lincoln Reds. Um, we've done so many system changes here with organic conversion, change of breed, change of feed, change of farming system. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to work out which one affects which. Uh, but certainly on the on the beef cattle front, we have our own butchery as well. And so we see the, the direct result come back in uh, and see it hanging. And I challenged myself during COVID to eat a cow, which I achieved. And I've eaten every single part of it. Uh, as have my family. Um, <laughs> the one thing I can say categorically is for a family who are faddy about fat and like to cut it off, you know, I now don't see any fat cut off and anything left on the plate, which tells me the fat itself is nutritious, it's tasty, and it's not repellent. We also supply restaurants, um, we supply other butcheries, and we supply supermarkets as well. Scott Beef, who supply Marks and Spencers, and interestingly, I have to pretend I fed them on barley or they won't take them because they think the fat will be the wrong colour. <laughs> so we are in a very much a sort of learning curve, but I know that the quality is there. Um, as far as the sheep are concerned, I didn't realise people didn't pass to finish sheep, so I didn't realise I was uh, in a minority. I can't see there's any point in feeding sheep on anything else. They finish, we start lambing in March, and within 12 weeks the first lambs are away um killing out at uh, 22 and a half kilos and we aim to get uh 40 percent of the lambs away before the end of june and then we have a break while everybody else catches up and then we feed them into the market until the following may and we only feed grass and then we sell uh, mutton as well we've um, our cull you mutton which has become quite popular um again grass fed the, the fat is different the, the the essential thing about lamb is that people tend not to like it because they say it's fatty and it, and it smells pasture fed meat doesn't smell and it's the fat is not a problem so we're still learning we definitely haven't got there just yet but i think we're heading <laughs> on the path and um the most enjoyable thing about it is learning uh, learning about cattle again and learning about grasses and soils and all of the intricacies in there that uh, up until we started this we used to phone the mineral consultant and he told us how to farm. Uh, <laughs> right, right now, we don't have a mineral consultant. Anyway, that's about it. So thank you. So. Um, that's that's fantastic. Um, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, start this off. Um, I'm going to ask Nick a question of what is it you said that the key thing for you is eating quality. What does eating quality mean to you? Is that, is it marbled? Is it tender? Is it fat? Is it, what, what is it that is eating quality to you? Um, okay, well, I did a little bit of study, a little bit of work on this at college a few years ago. David Best was one of my little classmates there. Just seen him pop up. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it tenderness and flavour. Um, our, we're getting to know our customers quite well in, in, in the locality where we where we trade, um, and we do quite a lot of online through other sort of bigger platforms. And um, the British, what I was judge, well, sorry, you know, the, 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 you know, the research shows, and I think it's been proven now anecdotally that um, British customers will will, 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 will prioritise tenderness. Um, Whereas flavour, you know, the more robust flavours are possibly from, from some of the other cultures or Europeans and other cultures. But we get a mix of customers. We have a lot of South African customers as well. So quality to us um, is tenderness is first and foremost, I would say, because then no one, you know, a chewy steak or a chewy piece of beef, they say it can put people off the whole category for weeks or even months. You know, everyone, everyone you know, every, you can always remember where you had a chewy steak if it's in a restaurant or a pub or a butcher, right? You can always remember that chewy steak. It's, it can be quite damaging. So tenderness, um, but surprisingly, I guess, even, you know, we, we are slaughtering beef cross steers and heifers from sort of 16 months onwards. And then some of the dairy cows can be, you know, five years plus. And even those dairy cows um, uh, from Johnny Ryder, they're not big animals. They're not, they haven't worked, they haven't done an awful lot of 
quite they're very low stress healthy animals even at the older age you're still having calves and they're over 10 years old so that meat is tenderized is, is, is becoming tender after th three weeks on the hook which is and because it's dairy it's just so buttery and creamy so that's that's a okay. gift that's a sort of gift of the dairy if you like it's just it tenders it you know it's, it's ready quickly and it's just so soft cool thank you um so first questions uh, i'm going to uh, combine uh, these three together for you, Nigel. Um, what what are your finishing group grazing on? What sort of dead weights do you get at two years old, and do they all go at two? And um, how do you get a beast ready for slaughter? So, relatively quick. What 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 can you say about those? So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we've got. A pretty mixed sword really um it's not it's not the greatest i've got to say uh it's gradually improving what we did with the finishing group was just set them apart and put them ahead of the herd um so they had ample grass we really pushed them um as i said twice a day moves they weren't really competing for anything at all so it just we just filled them up and that well, we're currently still doing the same we're still filling them up uh, and they are piling the weight on, so that worked well. Um, dead weights again, massively on genetics. Uh, spoke to the butchers a number of years ago. What they really wanted, they essentially didn't want anything bigger than three hundred and fifty. At that point in time, we were still had some genetics running through Belgian blues and so on and so forth in part of the herd, and we were getting animals that are excess of four hundred kilos and still not finishing them. Um, so that was a big problem, hence why we have changed and we have changed dramatically through the genetics that have come through from the Rob Havard bull. Um, the majority of what we are finishing now definitely sit under 350. Um, but again, they're all individuals and, and this is our task now is to, is to finish uh, 12 months a year. So we are, you know, at, Currently, I have got some animals out there that are, uh, what are they, 20, oh. 20 months, the ones that uh, ship yes. on. So, yeah, I've currently got a batch of animals that are 20 months and, and they look finished now. Um, we, but I won't let them go probably until, I would say, April is when they will end up going. Um, but as I say, they're all individuals. I have, I have also got some steers that have got a bit of dairy in them um yeah they could be mistaken for giraffes because they keep <laughs> going up and up and up and up um but it is surprising they've got long legs but they still probably fit they'll still probably finish around 360 but they just take that little bit longer to get there but at the same time in some ways for our system what we're doing you know i still want animals that are going to go in january and february and and they will fit the bill for that so we don't panic about it we just they finish when they finish cool. uh, Thank you. That pretty um, much covers it, I think. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, Sam, how many um, months of the year um, do you finish cattle? Bearing in mind that you're, you're much nearer the beginning of this process and possibly closer to where people are who are watching who haven't started yet. So we're still on a spring calving pattern and because of our change of breed and various other reasons, I'm really hard on our calving pattern. So we're calving over eight weeks, bulls only out for eight weeks. It means that we have all calves on the ground in two months and then we try and finish 365 days a year. So that poses a challenge for two reasons. One is I actually would be delighted to have a 36 month old animal killed uh, for our own butchery but the abattoir skills in being able to split and uh, deliver back a very tidy split carcass is limited. So we try and finish before 30 months. So that really limits how much, you know, therefore we need to be able to pull something else out, you know, 11 months before that to get it finished. So we're really finishing anywhere between 20 and 30 months old. Um, we finish we can finish at all times of year. There's no difference for us. It's just about the age that animal's at. I suppose our skinniest months are probably November uh, when we're transitioning between different groups, but that's about learning how to push on the young groups faster. And I think that we're learning what to push harder. 
Um, and there's also a huge variation in genetic diversity in what we've got. We're learning certain family groups work better than others. And that just means they're better suited to our system. Cool. Thank you. Um, Nick. Do you know how the dairy cross calves that you get are reared in the first few months of their life? Yeah, I mean, the, the system at the Ethical Dairy is, is very well publicised, very high profile. So all the calves are with their um, with their mothers, with the cows for five to six months. They are um, the cows are milked once a day in that period and the calves exclusively with their mums for the first five, six months. Down at Horton, um, different system. Some of the dairy herd keep their calves. Some are um, sort of adopted out onto surrogate cows. Some of the older cows might suckle a couple, two calves up. Um, but the increase, increasingly with Johnny, he is single suckling every calf. So, um, and then he's finding that some of those cows, you know, they might do three or four months with their calf, and then when they come back into the dairy herd, they're actually even milkier than normal sort of thing. So um okay it's difficult to speak on for the farmers you know because that's the technical side of what they do but but yes all calves every single calf is 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 up is um is on the cow for between you know between five and eight months so it's getting i guess that's getting close to a, a regular suckler system yeah 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 cool thank you um uh next question actually i'm going to put it to nigel now i'm going to move to sam on sheep um, how many mobs, how do you run your mobs of cattle? Um, do you have a young mob and an old mob, or do you put them all together? Shall I go first? Yeah, um, you, you go for it, and then I'm going to move on to Sam in a minute. Yeah, I mean, a lot a lot of our, if you like, our, our learnings have come from Greg Judy, and Greg Judy preaches run one mob as often as you can because you save your labour. And so... The majority of the time we do run one mob. Uh, it is exceptional due to due to the drought, which is why we decided to separate the finishing mob this year. Uh, and then, of course, when we're putting the bull in, if we've got anything that doesn't want to go to the bull, we set that off. So that gives us two mobs. But although saying that at the moment, we're currently running three mobs because we've got a separate piece of land. Uh, but yeah, yeah, given choice, all as one. As few as possible. OK. And Sam, um, what breed of sheep do you have? And um, in the sense of trying to have as few mobs as possible, how many mobs do you have between cattle and sheep? And how does, how does the interaction between the two work? So the easiest answer is the breed of sheep. Um, we have two flocks in early and late lambing. We focus on a Scotch grey faced mule ewe, and then we cross that with a Suffolk uh, Hampshire Down or uh, a Texel and all that we lamb, all you lambs as well to a Shetland that spans a finishing age or date for the lambs. Um, in terms of the number of mobs we have because of our pedigree breeding, we have had horrendous time with nine mobs of cattle and six mobs of sheep, um, which is, we, we, we're not going to repeat it it's too many uh, we try and keep things separated we're running just about a thousand head of cattle uh, at the peak and by the time you've got using lambs involved you're probably just short of three thousand um uh sheep on the place as well there is a limit to the size i think we can handle with handling pens with um just how you actually physically handle those numbers what we've learned is that uh, a mob of 125 cows and calves you can get water to them with some fairly poor watering systems once you've gone over that you struggle with our young stock <clears throat> we reckon that the mob size maximum seems to be about 300 because when it's very wet they can make an awful mess uh, very quickly and so we try and keep it around the 250 so we actually do move multiple mobs but it also means that we don't find that we're moving over a large distance uh, we tend to work in circuits, if you like, and if you've got too big a mob, your circuit ends up enormous. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, actually, Nigel, I think this might be your question. Now, hear me out here. Uh, so uh, we've got a question about getting lots of rain in North Wales, and um, if cattle and sheep are out on wet land, um, 
how are people in similar situations fattening and keeping energy intakes up in their cattle? Now you're not, um, you, you don't get that much rain because you're in the southeast, um, but you are on quite heavy clay. Um, so presumably you have to be quite um, delicate with the way you manage it. We, we do. And um, so, yeah, we've had a tremendous amount of rain over the last uh, six weeks, to be honest. Um, and so when it is wet, we, we, we move them frequently. We keep them going fast. Um, you don't want to dwell. Give them um, a bigger area. Bigger area and just keep them moving. As I say, the twice a day moves. You might, if, it's, if you really are getting bucket loads, you may want to move them three times a day. Um, again, in a perfect world at the moment, we would like to be bale grazing, supporting to slow up and up on the grass, but because of the because of the wet, you don't get the opportunity to do that. So as Penny says, bigger area and just keep them moving. Keep them full. Cool, thank you. Um, we've got a question about fat classes. Nick, um, I'm, I'm gonna ask you this first. Um, do you have any idea what the fat class is of the animals that come into your butcher? Yeah, yeah, we, we the, the avatars we deal with do do give us a grading. Um, Styles in Chippenham is where we kill again ninety percent of our. And actually, that's not true. Sorry, we do snails for the OTMs. So yeah, same as saying about the spinal. That's a whole other sub. We can have a whole webinar just on on spinal removal for OTM. But um, uh, sorry, these uh, styles are quite hard. I think they're quite hard on their gradings. But yeah, this is highly relevant because. Again, we're not showing that beef in a cabinet or we're not putting it in a display cabinet in a, in a shop or no one's really seeing it. So having a lot of external fat cover for us is not that important. It's not that worthwhile. I mean, we know because ultimately we're paying for that fat, although it's beautiful to eat, as Sam says, it, it is. It's incredibly, it's a great, you know, it's an incredible product. And we've, we do render it down for dripping. We, we're trying to get that going in volume with another partner. Um, and that is, you know, like a byproduct we're trying to, but trimming lots and lots of fat off because, again, our customers and uh, don't want excessive amounts of external fat on their steaks, um, on the rumps or whatever, or, or the lamb chops. So um, marbling will always be, of course, be important, but we're, we're sort of blessed there that the jersey and the red pole, I think genetically marble up. I mean, I think Jersey is the most marbled of all the native breeders now or something. And although they're not, they're, although they obviously don't fill out confirmation wise, it's, they marble up early. And so do Red Pole. That's why Red Pole, Johnny, Johnny did some research when we were doing the veal in the early days. And um, he, he found that veal was the uh, Red Pole, sorry, was the original breed back in the you know, 50s and beforehand, but was used for dairy veal because it does start to lay, lay, put down some intramuscular fat marbling uh, earlier. So um, carcass grading for us, um, most of our beef. Most of the animals we take that are destined for beef, for, for beef and for steaks, you know, for prime cuts, uh, will grade O2 and O3. And for us, that's satisfactory, I'll be honest. Um, you know, an O plus three for us is a, is a good result, and we, 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 that's, that's no issue for us whatsoever. Um, okay. Probably a perfect carcass for us would be something like an R3. Uh, we don't need a 4 L fat cover. We don't, um, don't need to hang it that long. We don't we'll end up trimming a lot of the fat off. It would look great. I say it would look great in a you know, an, an aging cabinet in a butcher shop or, in a, or a chef, a chef would love to look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't it, for our business, the way we, because we, uh, we sell the final cut, you know, the customers can see the meat and it's almost on their plate. So and they're cooking it. So it's not as important to us, but the marbling will always be important because that's obviously eating quality, okay. but that's where the jersey and the red pole, you know, they, they, do, they sort of do the work for us. So, And um, mo mo similar question, Sam, to you, um, you're, you're selling to Scott Beef, um, you know, a, a lot of your animals. Do you, do you find that uh, you can get them to a 4L uh, fat class? Uh, and do Scott Beef care? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, we're still hitting the spec for commercial um, supermarket spec. We, we still finish over 80% of our cattle go out to the R4L or above. Um, for our own butchery, we pick out the, the, the four H's. That's what we're after. We, the more fat, the better. <clears throat> Luckily, I live in the land where you know, deep fried Mars bars are, are still considered health snacks. So you know, fat is good and we can get fat from grass. Um, and uh, I'm not sure who, who to ask this question to. 
Um, Nigel, in your work with lots of the supply chain, um, why do you think there is a demand for carcasses under 350 kilos? It's, I mean, I, I, I don't quote me this. I think a lot, some, some of it is driven by the supermarkets because they want their steaks to fit in their packet quite nicely. Um, also, you talk to the actual individual butchers, they don't want to hump around a great big carcass either. Uh, it is, in the main, I think, driven by steak sizes. People don't want these huge sirloins anymore. They want, you know, your nice size, 200 gram sirloin, and, and that's what you that's what you're going to deliver when you get your carcass under 350. So I say 400, 450 kilo carcasses. It horrifies the butchers that I'm working with. Certainly, I don't know what Nick's viewpoint on that is, but Nick, if somebody sent you a 380 kilo carcass, we've never had we've never had a prime beef animal over 300 over about 300, 320, and the average size of the beef we take from Johnny Ryder which again may horrify people on the, at the other end of the scale is 220 i mean it's dexter size i mean it's they're two they're 220 240 um it's a work in progress i mean but the johnny's dairy cows are not big and I, i'm sure some of you have been down to Horton. they're not big animals they're they're not big cows therefore they don't produce big calves he doesn't put big balls over them um it, it wouldn't work for his system so we you know these calves are never gonna hit that sort of um that size and for, for us, yes, it means that, you know, the yield in our butchery, the economics, uh, we have to make it work and the price we pay reflects that. But for us carrying the, the carcasses around and lifting them out of vans and that, yeah, there is, a, there is that aspect to it unquestionably. And the portion size, I mean, if you cut a ribeye or a sirloin steak from a 200, let's say 250 kilo carcass, it's actually a really lovely size. You know, you can cut it an inch thick, it's, it hits you, you get your 250 gram spec, your eight ounce, sorry, your 10 ounce spec or whatever. Um, and we have to do a lot of that because we supply Abel and Coles. We have to hit every, you know, we have to cut every steak to that 250 gram spec, uh, every rump steak, and that is a nice. So 250 kilos is, is a, actually a really nice size to work with. Um, it's also a lot less physical strain on the, our butchers as, as, as people. You know, cutting through 350, 400 kilo carcasses is heavy work. You know, it's heavy, heavy work. Yeah. But um, okay. yeah. thank you. Um, I've I've got a question for the. Um, everyone on the um in the audience um if there are any butchers who are on the call uh, can they put an answer into the chat to this question which is um what is your opinion and experience of uh, meat taint with uh, cattle fed on brassicas near the finish so anyone who has an opinion on um brassica taints in meat um I, i'd love to hear hear your um hear your opinions um i have a question for, for you sam what's your stocking density uh we're currently running low we're about uh, 0.9 uh, livestock units uh, per hectare not including lambs um obviously they change very quickly throughout the season I am not proud of that. It's part of our conversion process. And we put, I suppose, almost 60% of our land has been sown to grass in the last couple of years. So it's not really just quite just there yet. We use herbal lays. Um, they don't get going in the year one. They're quite slow. Um, but we can certainly see where they have established that that rate can go up. Hence the number of cattle that we will be running on the same area in 2024 will have gone up considerably. Cool, thank you. Um, and um, uh, Sam, um, actually no, sorry, Nigel, um, how are you finding cattle finished late winter and early spring? Do you find that you can put condition on over the winter or are you, going to I mean you did say that you had some 20 month old ones that you're going to keep is that common um do you get condition now and just hold it through the winter or do, or are you able to put extra condition on as you go through the winter um <clears throat> we're finishing the animals quite well at the moment because there's just so much grass out there since the uh, rain came after the drought um there's the just a phenomenal amount of grass and it's still been so mild uh, grass is still growing 
uh, down here. Um, and uh, we're just able to put as much in to them as, as we can. Uh, fa have not successfully finished animals in winter on silage yet. Uh, although saying that, that 24 month old that uh, um, we sold in March last year finished virtually on hay. Um, <laughs> I think that may be down to his genetics. I'm, I'm not really oh, sure. Wow. It's still a learning curve for us. So yeah, I okay. haven't really got an answer. Well, cool. Thank you. Um, and Sam, um, this is about your sheep over the winter. What are they eating? So it was one of the questions in there was how do we manage them? Do they follow or do we treat them separately? Uh, generally speaking, our sheep follow the cattle. I know other people tell you that the sheep should go first. Actually, we just find it easier, particularly when grass is tall to stop electric fences arcing out that they follow. And I treat the sheep a little bit like the sort of saprophyte in the background. They just clear up. Um, and it still it still seems to work. So our sheep only ever eat grass. We don't put them on anything other than grass, except for the skinny months of probably March and April. We will graze cereals with them as well, which actually suits us because our cereals are already you know, starting to romp away. And as a growth regulator, we'll use them as a as a tool. If we've got cover crops, we'll tend to put cattle on them um, rather than sheep just because they do a better job of trampling. And I think they are better at using cover crops. We have mixed it around. We found that sheep are very selective in what they eat, um, whereas cattle are pretty good at just eating whatever's given to them. Yeah, I think that's um, that's been our experience too. Um, uh, this is another one, I think, for Nigel. Um, how, how do you maintain uh, how do you balance maintaining a high clover content in the sward uh, with a longer uh, rest period and higher covers? Uh, well, we find that uh, um, with the mob grazing, um, moving um, the cattle off uh, an area um, as soon as they've grazed it, that the clover just comes back. It comes back far better than uh, um, when we were set stocking. Um, yeah, and the, the clover just uh, seems to spread, especially if you uh, let it flower before you put the cows in, uh, the cattle will spread the clover for you. Um, uh, yeah, the clover will uh, doesn't like competing with grass. So if the grass is taken down and um, then the cattle are moving up, moved off, we find that clover really really responds well to mob grazing yeah that's a similar experience uh, to what we find um uh, there there are a couple of questions here about um a silage taint um in addition to my uh, question about um brassica taint uh jock thank you um saying that he doesn't doesn't have an issue with brassica taint as long as it's not a majority of the diet um he doesn't have an issue with silage taint which is the same as what um uh, andy rumming has said as well uh and but he is saying there there might be an issue as a sudden change of diet just before slaughter but um i would imagine that most people are trying to be slaughtering on a diet that's been like that for a decent length of time um uh, what have we got here um apparently there are going to be some pfl dairy beef uh, webinars coming up um so um th those should be pretty interesting um uh David Best, you're talking about your um, your system. Do you want to unmute yourself and talk about that? Yeah, once I finally find the unmute. There we go. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I just thought it was interesting by comparison, really, but I don't know how other people are finding things. Because you were talking about finishing things quite lean with relatively lower weights. And I just thought it was interesting. Uh, we sent a, a couple of um, steers off this autumn or end of September, which went to Dunbia. They went in, they were about 600 to 650 kilos live before they went away. They killed out at an average 340 kilo carcass. Um, and I've given the price that the Dunbia paid, which I thought was not, I mean, I don't know, because we're only, we're beginners really, but so it seemed reasonable to me. Um, we also put two, which was similar weight. Um, we had them butchered, packed, and came back to our freezer, which we've sold as boxed meat. And we ended up getting back as packed beef, 200 kilos. What I, firstly, what I don't know is, is that actually quite good or not, or is it terrible? Um, and certainly we found that the beef has been great. It's been unbelievably well received by everybody that, that's, that's had it from us. We find that we are, we are PFLA uh, uh, um, um, certified. So we're, the beef we're raising has nothing but grass or haylage. Um, and the, the meat is, it, it is quite fatty because I, I personally quite like it with a bit of fat on. So we do tend to possibly hang on to them maybe a little longer than we should. Um, but the beef taste is staggering. Um, so sweet um, is probably the best way I can describe it. Tender, but sweet as well. Um, but I, one of the things that sort of raised questions for me, and I'll forgive me if I'm, I'm going on a little too long here, but we don't have a lot of ground. We've got about 110 acres of grass. We've got 50 ewes. Um, we've got 11 sucklers at the moment, um, which with their follow various followers. And I'm just about to increase the number of sucklers from 11 to 19. And I'm, I'm still gonna do it, but this summer has been a bit of a shock because um, we're in West Wales where I thought it always rained and, and the grass always grew. Um, but this summer we had a, a, a drought that everybody had and things got pretty tight. A lot of our neighbours were feeding haylage in August um, from this year's cut. Yeah. And I'm slightly worried what, what will happen to us um, and how will we cope if we get that situation once we go, you know, I know it's only small numbers, 11 going to 19, but 19 becomes 60 animals quite quickly if we're taking them through to finishing. Just curious what anybody else has experienced with that and whether, whether or not I'm taking a bit of a big risk with it. Sam, can you tackle that? Um, for every extreme in one direction, I see there's an extreme in the other. Um, we have worried about similar things and currently we sit with a shed full of hay uh, for emergencies because one day we'll need it and being faced by a whole load of hungry cattle is no fun so we do carry forage in stock in case we need it and i'm not afraid to use it if we do um i i certainly think that there is a balance i almost it's almost irrelevant what your livestock units per hectare are actually What's important is can you carry them 365 days a year outside? And what does it cost you to do that? So we're all hell bent on finishing it, you know, 20 months old and, and uh, livestock units held, et cetera. But actually, what's the margin on the, on the beast? And we've taken out huge costs out of our system, you know, proper costs that we weren't going to find with a little tweak here with efficiency and a little tweak there. And what I've found is that I don't mind if I lose a bit of daily live weight gain. It costs so little. We'll just finish them a bit later. Actually, it's a much more resilient system that can cope with that weather and climate change. Absolutely. Um, uh, it's funny, no disasters question yet. And actually, I think this is the one of the, the key questions uh, that we all need to know. Uh, Nigel, I'm going to put this to you, and then I'm going to put it to Sam as well. How do you assess that a beast is finished? 
Uh, well, Andy Rumming's comment is, is great, and he, he's right. Yeah, it is great if you put them in the crush and you can feel them. Um, it's, it's a learning curve, I think, and, and it is also great to see the animal uh, when it's killed out, you get a much better assessment. We are extremely fortunate that, that we do see most of our animals now. We've got a great relationship with our butcher, so go and have a look at them. And you know, you do get a few surprises now and again, but most of the time between Penny and I, mainly Penny to be quite frank, uh, she chooses the ones that she thinks are ready to go. We have a little discussion, I then give in. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, we. you look at the brisket, you certainly look at the ribs um, in discussion with some of the butchers I've worked with, focus on the ribs, and then the real big indicator is the tail head. Okay. Sam, what about you? Yeah, same for me. I'm looking for as much fat as possible. The tail head is the best indicator. Uh, I look for cattle with big, deep briskets, um, but that's the breeding we've got. I'm looking for a big, big wobbly fat brisket and a big fat tail head. If those two ends of the beast are looking right, the bit in the middle will be fine. I'll just, I'll just just mention Greg Judy. He gets it right every time. He said they've got to be busting out of their britches, and when they look like that, they're, they're, yeah, you've got a good one. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, we have a question. I'm not sure that any of us are going to know the answer to this. Are the majority of glass finishers selling direct to consumer, or are there many selling into the commodity market? Well, on this call here, uh, Nick is buying them direct from farmer, so. Like that, like that. Nigel is sell, selling direct to consumer. Sam is doing a bit of both, selling some direct to consumer and some into the commodity market. And uh, we at Bobberney are selling mostly to the commodity market still. So I don't know how representative that is of the overall market. Nigel, what can you could you say anything about it? Um. I think, uh, and I'll, I'll, I would like probably like to bring Rob, Rob Bunn, who, who, who shares the job role in the UK with me, um, into into this. But our overview is is there's a big percentage uh, of farmers that are selling direct. Um, we are gradually chipping away at selling direct to butchers who who will market it for what it is as pasture for life certified beef. Unfortunately, there are I, I do feel there's an awful lot that slips out of the net uh, and and gets sold uh, without the pasture for life pasture for life name on it, which I find incredibly disappointing. Really, um, it, it's a moment. It feels like it's a current battle for wholesalers to want to take this produce on and sell it for for what it is. Um, like I say, it just it just seems to be slipping in as anything. We're not we're not seeing the premiums. I believe we should be getting for it, um, but the quality of the product tells the story really. And I th just think it's a matter of time. Uh, the general public will, in the end, in my mind, demand it. And when they demand it, the butchers will want to supply it. So Absolutely. we just got to keep chipping away. Absolutely. Um... Uh, Sam, going back to the sheep, what kind of covers do the ewes go into during their winter grazing? Um, and are they on deferred grass all the way through to lambing? And uh, when, really when does really the early flock lamb? You, you, I think you said you lamb in April, oh. right? March. Yeah, early lambing flock starts 1st of March. Um, but they're just really following cattle the whole time. So our, our principle when we get to this time of year is we're not mob grazing and we're not tangled up in fences all day. We just make sure that they never hear the church bell, hear the church bell toll twice. They move every seven days. And the reason for that was actually that management of sheep is down to individual animals being pulled out for poor feet or managed for whatever. And unless you've got incredible dogs, doing that amongst fences isn't fun. So we we do use fences periodically, but I try and cut that out and just keep sheep moving. So basically, it's the frequency of move that is the important thing for the sheep. Johnny, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so does... It, 
do um, either Sam or Nigel do any um, overseeding? And do you have any good advice for improving the nutritional quality of a sward by overseeding? Nigel? Penny? Penny. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, we have done some overseeding to try to improve pasture, um, putting in a simple herbal lay overseeding mix, which uh, worked quite well. We scratched it in using uh, harrows uh, and rolled it, and uh, um, that took quite well. Um, we do a lot of bale grazing, unrolling bales, uh, buy, bought in hay, trying to buy in species rich hay. Um, which is working really well, spreading all sorts of things are starting to turn up in the um, sward um, that weren't there before, but I'm not sure whether some of that is from the natural seed bank anyway. Um, but as the soil improves with uh, the mob grazing, so the sward improves and the quality of the grass that the cattle are eating improves. So I think um, managing the soil is probably more important than uh, the sward. Okay, Sam. Anything to add? Yeah, we've been um, we've been sowing all, um, all everything we've sown over the last few years have been herbal lays, um, mix of seventeen different species, and we, because of the additional area and being unable to build the livestock numbers up fast enough, we've seen our uh, rest period extend beyond ninety days now. Um, that's detrimental. That's not helping us. So we do forage analysis throughout the season as well. And we know that from August onwards, unless we can get round fast enough early enough, that grass quality, the metabolizable energy of that grass is actually dipping away to a level which particularly young cattle cannot eat enough to maintain growth rates that we would expect. So we're gonna artificially increase our rotation speed by just scooting over the top of it quickly. But measuring daily live weight gains and um, doing forage analysis, mineral analysis, et cetera, these are all the things we're having to do to learn probably what my grandfather knew already. So is, you know, it, it does feel a little bit, you feel a bit embarrassed about learning the simple, simple things that you should have known. Yeah, okay. Um, and I've got one question for Nick. Um, I know most of your beasts that you take in are quite young. Do you take in any older ones as well? And um, what's the difference in an older beast in terms of its flavour tenderness profile? Okay. Um, it's about 50 50. It's not, I wouldn't say most of them are young. I mean, okay. to get, I, sorry, sorry. I mean, when I said I dropped in, I said sort of 16 months onwards. We don't, well, we, were taking, answer, we were taking the old one from David. Finley because he was getting some good growth rates but let's just say they're sort of 22 half of it's UTM which is beef cross UTMs and then the other half are OTMs um and it was the question the difference in the eating quality and the flavor yeah um yeah I mean um the spinal is a you know the abattoir with the VC spinal OTM is is a real ch challenge um the what's the answer to that question really i mean the grass fed you know the, the, the utms at 24 26 months will be tender to eat the steaks will be ready in two or three weeks to eat they'll be you know, beautifully creamy the, the fat will be getting yellowish but it'll be a very nice um you know, it's a rock solid product the otm um if the confirmation of the animal is is reasonable then you'll get a good portion size. It will obviously be a darker appearance. You'll get that beautiful dark yellow fat, which is incredible flavor and nutrition as, as we know. Um, stronger flavor, uh, not massively. No, not massively. I mean, it's, you know, these are hundred percent grass fed animals. So we, yeah, we, we have a real mix. Now. Our fridge is always a real mixed bag of older stuff and UTM. So we just, you know, you just pick what you want when you want it. We just pick as it's ready, as it comes ready. Yeah, as it's ready, okay. and and because we do whole carcass, and because we sell so much mints and burgers and dice and all that, we 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 get that stuff cut and done, sold within ten, you know, generally within ten days, fourteen days, and then the steaks sit a bit longer. But um, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, we have just slightly run over. 
Um, so thank you very much to our panel. Um, just sum up the key messages that I've got from that. Um, uh, genetics, hugely important. Um, uh, uh, mob grazing um, seems to be a key component uh, of um, getting them finished. Uh, the key thing in, in what is a finished animal is the eating quality. Um, uh, and size, we don't want the size up to about 350 kilos is a good number. Above that starts to get a bit big. Um, and always learning. It's a, uh, there's lots of trial and error. Um, and uh, certainly uh, our experience, there's um, a hell of a lot of error. Um, and um, uh, you always learn from it. So, Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you very much to Nigel and Penny. Thank you to Nick. Thank you to Sam. Uh, and thank you to all of you for uh, signing on. I hope that uh, everyone uh, learned something from these guys here and uh, we will see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.